The outlook for DC fast charging here in North America had never been brighter. The entire industry was coalescing around a single connector. Interoperability was finally within reach. And then Elon Musk pulled the pin of a hand grenade and lobbed it into the bunker of the entire industry. Let's talk about it. I am, of course, talking about the news that Tesla fired Rebecca Tanushi, who's the senior director of charging infrastructure at Tesla, and her entire team of 500 employees. These are the people that were in charge of maintaining and building out the supercharger network, Tesla's greatest asset, as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I was so shocked to hear this. Quite honestly, I wouldn't have been more shocked if I heard that Tesla was dropping the Model S and the Model X, or let's say they decided to close Fremont, or uh, even if Tesla announced that Elon Musk was going to step down as CEO. And that's because the supercharger network is so integral to Tesla's success. I never thought in a million years that they would undercut their ability to continue to build out the network and to maintain it. Now, to be fair, Elon has tweeted that they are going to continue to build out the network, but at a slower pace, and that they're going to focus on maintaining the current supercharger network, although they've maintained that really well up until now. Uh, the downtime is so minimal, I don't think they could even improve upon that. And he also said that they're going to expand some of the current locations, which is kind of weird because most Tesla sites aren't designed for expansion. It would cost almost as much to put in an entire new site, say, you know, a couple miles away. So it's kind of a weird thing for him to say. And, you know, every now and then Elon does say weird things. I think uh, this tweet might have just kind of been damage control to tell people, don't worry about it. We're still going to do this and that and this and everything's going to be really fine. But I don't think there's any way to put a positive spit on this. This is bad for Tesla and it's bad for the whole industry, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I'm not going to make a very long video here today. There's a lot of people that's been talking about it. And honestly, I still need some time to absorb this. I just, I had to come out and say something. Um, I wasn't going to initially, but honestly, I keep getting emails from industry stakeholders. Some of them are from OEMs. Some of them are from tier one suppliers, basically asking me, hey, Tom, do you have any contacts that are still there? Because we were working with a team of 10 people on this project or that project. I really can't mention what. Uh, and now they're all gone. And we don't know what to do. We don't know who to contact. I mean, that's just crazy that Tesla would do this to all of their partners that, they're, that they've been working with. Um, uh, so anyway, I felt I just need to talk about it a little bit, even if it's a short video. I'm going to talk just briefly about um, two groups of, say, affected people. First off, the uh, EV drivers that own Teslas and even uh, other EVs that now we're going to be getting access to the Tesla supercharger network. And then also a little bit about industry professionals like those that I just referred to that are kind of being left in the dark now. And um, that's not good. It's not good for the industry. And it's really surprising Tesla would do this. So let's get into it. State of Charge is powered by Qmerit. After I've helped you decide which electric vehicle charging equipment you're going to buy, follow the link in the description of my videos and let the EV charging installation professionals at Qmerit install it. So let's talk a little bit about how this is going to affect electric vehicle owners. First up, Tesla drivers. Now, Tesla drivers were always proud of the fact that they had exclusive access to the best electric vehicle charging network in the world, this ever expanding network. It seemed like no matter how many stations Electrify America or EVgo put in the ground, Tesla put in more. And that's true. They actually ramped up installation of Tesla supercharger sites recently. It's not like they started to let off. Tesla was going full bore. They were doubling down on the network and installing more and more sites, which was fantastic. And it inspired owners or potential owners to say, look, there might be an area here where there aren't superchargers, but Tesla is installing these things everywhere. And it's just a matter of time before they put them in the area that I need them. People can no longer rely on that. 
because that's not going to happen. Tesla is pulling back on the installation of new superchargers. And that's, it's unfortunate. I mean, the supercharger network was always Tesla's kryptonite. <laughs> I looked at it as to fend off competing brands. I, I had so many of my followers ask me for advice on buying electric vehicles. And it's not like I would only recommend Tesla's. But I would ask them, do you need to drive long distances frequently? Are you going to be using public charging infrastructure? Can you charge at home? And quite frequently, if the person needed to use public infrastructure a lot, like if they couldn't charge at home almost all the time or if their job took them on the road or everything, I would just say, look, get a Tesla because it just works. The chargers are everywhere. There's always an open stall. You know, they have eight, 10 chargers at every location. You go to an Electrify America site, there's four stations. An EVgo site, there's two stations. They're blocked, they're not working. So the supercharger network was such an advantage. And I'm not saying that's gonna go away. It's not gonna go away. It's just disappointing that they're not putting pedal to the metal to continue to open up this gap. Hopefully, uh, like Elon said, they'll continue to maintain them. And if that's the case, while this will be bad, it may not be the complete disaster that it sounds like it's going to be. Um, so that's Tesla owners. In addition to them not getting new stations, they're concerned now that there's other makes of EVs that are going to be getting access to the supercharger network. Currently, Ford vehicles and Rivian vehicles. I own one of each. I own a, a, a F-150 Lightning and a Rivian R1S. I can charge both of those vehicles on Tesla superchargers. I also own a Chevy Bolt EV, and uh, that hasn't, uh, GM hasn't gotten access to the supercharger network yet, but it's imminent. It's gonna happen really soon. So I'll have three EVs that I can charge on Tesla supercharger networks. I'm taking up stalls. I'm using them all the time now when I need superchargers. And unfortunately, with the Rivian and the Lightning, I need to take up two parking spaces to charge at a Tesla supercharger. So there's Tesla owners, rightfully so, not happy when I pull up and take two stalls so I can charge my Lightning or my Rivian. And when people talk to me about that or ask me questions about that, I would say, listen, don't worry about it. Tesla's gonna be installing so many superchargers. They're gonna double down on it now because they're getting all this extra money from these companies and extra revenue from, from cars charging. They're gonna accelerate the installation of the supercharger network and expand it even faster. <laughs> Little did I know that I was dead wrong with that. Uh, I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again, but this one I was really wrong on because I really expected with the whole industry transitioning to the NAX now that Tesla was just going to go full on with superchargers and just uh, you know, just crush the competition as far as locations and uptime and everything. And, uh, you know, we have to reevaluate things now. As for the drivers of non-Tesla EVs, they'll have the same potential congestion problems that Tesla drivers are going to have, that there's going to be more vehicles at these Tesla supercharger sites. And if Tesla doesn't continue to install new ones, there's going to be a lot of congestion issues especially because some of the vehicles take up more than one parking space. But it gets worse than that, particularly if you own an electric vehicle from one of the companies that hasn't finalized all the software and the compatibility like Rivian and Ford has already. And I believe GM is pretty much there right now. What happens if you own another vehicle from another make? I really don't know. I can almost guarantee it's gonna take longer now than what it would have for you to get access because some of these companies are having difficulty getting in touch with Tesla to continue to work on this. And as I said, they need to work on this. It's not something that you just flip a switch and the cars are compatible and the native app from the car company communicates with the supercharger. That's not how it works. It takes a few months from teams on both sides working together to get this all to work. So yeah, I expect the transition now is gonna take longer. And that's if all the companies continue to work with Tesla on this. There's gonna be some companies that, or there may be some companies that say, you know what? We're not even gonna deal with them anymore. If this is how they treat us, uh, we're, we're, just, we're just gonna walk away. And that's gonna be really unfortunate for the drivers of these electric vehicles. Okay, so that's EV drivers. Uh, when it comes to other industry professionals and stakeholders, it's a 
another problem, which is maybe even bigger. And as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of the reason why that I decided to make this video, because I'm getting so many people reach out to me for advice and asking me if I have contacts. And the other OEMs, now Tesla has already pretty much completed the deal with Ford and Rivian. Those vehicles work. They have access. The Ford app and the Rivian app both work with the Tesla supercharger. Network. But this doesn't happen overnight. Both Ford and Rivian told me that their teams how to work with the Tesla teams for months to get this to all work smoothly. Uh, what happens to the other OEMs that haven't done this yet? Do they have counterparts now at Tesla that will work with them on this? I know one company in particular, and I can't mention names, is really worried about it because all the contacts that they had been talking to in the last month or two are gone. And they're sending emails and they just constantly bounce back. They're reaching out to everybody they know. So they literally said, look, do you know anybody that survived this? Because we just need somebody there to tell us who do we talk to because we're kind of in the middle of something here and we need to get it finished. So um, I, I just can't believe that Tesla did it in the way they did it to just leave this, this vacuum where there's just nobody there now for these companies to talk to. And these aren't you know, uh, I mean, it would be bad enough if their customers were left in the lurch, but I mean, these are partners. These are other OEMs. These are tier one manufacturers that are making products for superchargers and they don't have people to reach out to anymore. It's, it's, it's kind of mind boggling that Tesla went about and did it this way. Now we're already starting to see employees post videos online and talk in public about how they feel that this is not going to go well for Tesla, that there's just no people in the company left to do the job that they were doing, which was a very important job, and that uh, service, the quality of service for the superchargers is going to go down. Um, the uptime probably is going to be affected, even though Elon said it's actually going to get better. But this is a huge problem, and it's going to take some time before we really figure out just how damaging this move was to Tesla and the entire industry. All of these companies agreed to switch to Tesla's connector, to make this transition. Uh, it was better for their companies, it was better for the industry at whole. And now they might not have a reliable partner to help them in this transition, which they kind of need. You know, uh, Tesla agreed to give them access to the supercharger network. They agreed to, I'm sure, work with them on making their cars communicate with the Tesla supercharger system to make the interoperability very smooth. And now these companies are just kind of left in the lurch, not knowing when they're going to be able to talk to somebody, who they're going to be able to talk to, and when they're going to deliver what they promised to their customers, which was to be able to have access to Tesla superchargers. And what's this mean for V4 supercharger stalls? We were supposed to get these thousand volt high charging speeds for the Cybertruck can utilize the fact that it can charge up to 800 volts. People ordered the Cybertruck based on the fact that they were expecting to be able to charge quickly, eventually. And what does this mean for V4 supercharging? It sounds like we're not gonna get V4 superchargers at least anytime soon. So um, that's another, uh, say, casualty of this. Um, but where there's problems and uh, issues, there's opportunity. And uh, this could be an opportunity for the other industry players, Electrify America, EVgo, and the new network, Iona. That's General Motors, BMW, Mercedes, Hyundai, Kia, and Stellantis. Uh, they all formed a network, and they're going to be installing a DC fast charger. By 2030, they're supposed to have 30,000 uh, plugs in the ground in the U.S. Well, that was their projection. They now have a huge pool of experienced talent to draw on. I'm sure the, there's already been people hired uh, in this last day or two. So, I mean, there's some opportunity for them. There's also opportunity for them to get more of the NEVI funding because... You know, Tesla, first of all, probably shouldn't have qualified for NEVI funding in the first place if you really read the particulars of it, but they found some loopholes in some states. Some states, uh, you know, said, no, you're not getting any money here because uh, you don't qualify. 
But uh, I know Tesla did get some of the NEVI funding, and I'd assume now they're never going to apply for it anymore because they're not going to be installing many new uh, sites. So there's some opportunity there for these all of the competing networks to get uh, locations maybe that Tesla was going to get and put their chargers there, get some NEVI funding to do it, draw on the uh, talent pool that Tesla just let go. So uh, this could be a boom for some of the other networks. And quite honestly, electric vehicle drivers really don't care if they're going to a Tesla supercharger or an Electrify America or a new IANA or EVgo. They just want the chargers to work and to be in locations that are convenient for them to plug in. And currently, Tesla had the most convenient best working stations out there. And if you want to try to look at the bright side of this, maybe it's going to be the fact that the other networks take this opportunity to improve. And, uh, you know, the, the delta between Tesla and everybody else gets a little bit closer. My good friend Kyle Connor just put out a, a video on this. He ranted on for about 40 minutes, which Kyle's great at doing. He makes great content over at the uh, Out of Spec Reviews channel. You should check that out on YouTube. And uh, like me, Kyle's been getting messages and emails from people in the industry. We both have a lot of contacts. And what I found interesting was one of the people that reached out to him was from a German manufacturer, actually told him that they're having board meetings now over this to decide if they're going to actually continue down the path of switching to the NAX connector. They might just abandon it and go back to CCS1. That's how serious this is. This is not just, well, you know, Tesla's not going to have as many superchargers and, you know, um, they're not going to have that uh, huge advantage anymore and leave it up to the other companies to do the industry. No, this is goes much deeper and this is going to have long-term effects on the entire industry. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Elon lost his ability to pull out that card saying that, you know, everything he does for Tesla is for the good of humanity and the good of the EV industry and a rising tide raises all boats and everything. And he's done a lot of really good things. And Tesla has done a lot of amazing things for the industry, for electric vehicles in general, for their customers. But this one is a disaster. And it's really unfortunate that it was done the way it was done. As I said earlier, Tesla has every right to let go of its employees. All companies do. Um, some companies handle it better than others. But the way they did this, in the middle of the night, 500 jobs got slashed, important integral jobs that have effects on other people and other companies without replacing those people or giving these other companies contacts and said, look, uh, you know, John's not with us anymore, but here, talk to Mike and he'll help you. It's just, you know, hey guys, you figure it out. That's not the way to do business. And uh, I think Tesla in this move has proven to be an unreliable partner and a partner that other companies are not going to want to deal with moving forward. And that's not good for Tesla and it's not good for the industry. Listen, I'm sure everybody watching this video has a lot of opinions on this topic. Let's get a lively discussion going in the comment section. I'll try to respond to uh, whatever comments you have as much as I can. I know I get a lot of comments on my videos, which I'm very thankful for. My uh, followers are really great, very enthusiastic, love the electric vehicle industry, always have something to say. I'll try to respond to them. And uh, I'm sure this isn't the last video I'm going to do on this topic because, as I said, I need time to digest this. This is just um, came out of the, uh, the blue. It blindsided me, and I don't really even know how to react to it, and neither does any of the other people that I've talked to. Uh, we are going to be talking about this on the Batteries Included podcast this Friday. I'm not sure if this video is going to get out before that. i got to edit it and do some uh, work on it, but uh, if it does, don't forget to uh, tune in at 9.30 every Friday uh, for me, uh, Kyle Connor. <laughs> My good friend uh, Martin from the EV News Daily and also Dominic from uh, Driving Electric with Dominic, the Dude channel. And uh, we chat EVs every week, 9.30 on YouTube and on uh, X. We stream it live there. But tomorrow, for sure, we're going to have a very lively discussion about this. I wouldn't be surprised if it takes up the entire hour and a half. Listen, if this is your first time here at State of Charge, please hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming electric vehicle news and reviews. And as always, thanks for watching.